Okay, so as you probably guessed, this is a talk about cryptography. Um, I warn you up front, it's quite theory heavy, um, not a great deal of PHP code. Um, and I am aware it is 4 p.m. on Friday, so please try and stay in the room. <laughs> um, so, sort of an introduction. Um, what, what, what is it that we're talking about when we're talking about cryptography? So, modern cryptography covers sort of three quite important areas. The first one is probably the one that everyone sort of thinks of first is message privacy. Uh, that means ensuring that any communications between two parties can only be read by the intended recipient and, and the sender. Um, another, another sort of facet to, to modern cryptography is being able to verify a message. That's ensuring that a message that you've received um, is, is the message that was actually sent by the, the person that, that sent it, and it's not been tampered with between you and the sender. And, and one of the final sort of main areas that it deals with is identity verification. So ensuring that the message that you've received did actually come from the person who claims to have sent it, and it's not a fake message that you've, you've received from someone who's trying to play a bit of a joke on you. Um, so, so that's our sort of third, third area. Now, if you've been to any other talks, maybe at this conference or another one, um, on application security, you may have seen this talk. This, I think this is from last year or two years ago. Um, looks a bit like this. Cryptography is really quite a hard thing to, to get right, especially if you start get diving into di designing your own algorithms and things like that. Um, and so the, the main purpose of this talk is to take a brief journey through the evolution of cryptography, right from the very, very beginning, all the way up to the algorithms that we're using today, um, and try and give you a bit of an appreciation of quite why it's so hard and, and why it's important to get it right. Um, so I'm going to start with some historic ciphers, um, which, which you can actually do on pen and paper if you, if you want to. Um, and then I'm going to move on to some of the inner workings of, of things like AES and RSA, crypto systems, which are in use today. Um, so first, onto the historic ciphers. The, the first one we could take a look at, you've probably all heard of this one, the Caesar shift. It's probably about the simplest cipher you could, you could think up. Um, and the basic idea is, you take a message with some words, and in order to encrypt it, you shift characters in the message up or down the alphabet by a fixed amount. That look, look, looks a bit like this. Um, and you can see we've got like a, an alphabet at the top. And then in order to apply the Caesar shift transformation, encryption, on, on a message, we sort of shift each letter. So an A becomes a D, um, and then so on and so forth. Um, this is obviously a very short talk if this was the state-of-the-art modern cryptography. Um, so so what, what's actually wrong with this cipher? Why, why, why should you not use it? Um, well, it turns out that for, for a given alphabet, there's a very, very small number of possible keys. Obviously, you've only got 26 letters in the English alphabet, um, and that gives you 25 possible different shifts that you can use to encode a message using the Caesar shift. Because um, obviously, if you use a 26th one, it just encodes back to itself which isn't very useful either. Um, even if you were to use like binary, ASCII, and then apply Caesar shift, you're still only looking at 255 different possible shifts. Um, that would mean that any, anyone wanting to read a message that you've sent, that you've, you've encoded using a Caesar shift, could simply just run through, write a little script, try every different possible shift, and see which, which one made a message that made sense. And that'd be really easy for them to, to quickly run through and, and decode your message. This is quite important to us because it illustrates a really important aspect of a strong cipher. It's the fact that it's got to have a large number of possible keys. That's preventing any attacker from just iterating through them all to try and decode your message. Um, so move on to maybe a, another straightforward cipher, sort of an evolution step up, um, is, is a substitution cipher. And this, this works in a sort of a similar way, but instead of just moving letters up, we, we sh randomly shuffle them around. Um, so you just swap the letter, a letter in your, your plain text for a, letter, for, for a different random letter. Okay? And this looks a bit like this. So in this, this one, I've, I've sort of picked a, an encoding which changes A to a Z, a B to a N, C to Q, etc. And you, you do that for the entire alphabet. Um, how does it hold up? This one is actually significantly better 
for the Caesar shift algorithm um, using just English for your, your substitution and, and just letters. There are 403 septillion, 291 sextillion, 461 quintillion, 126 quadrillion, 605 trillion, 635 billion, 584 million possible different keys. It's quite a big number. Um, so with, with such a large, large number of keys, you'd think that this is a really, really quite strong cipher, right? Why aren't, we, why aren't we using a substitution cipher to, to store people's bank details? Well, turns out the weakness of the substitution cipher doesn't actually come from, from the low number of keys. Um, its security is equivalent to about an 88-bit key. So that, that's obviously not as strong as some of the modern ciphers that use 128 or 256 bits. But it's still pretty strong, and it's only sort of just within our, our computational capabilities to, to brute force a key of that size. Um, instead, the substitution cipher falls foul of probably the greatest nemesis of, of cryptographic algorithms, which is statistics. Okay? Due to the simplicity of the cipher, it, it fails to hide any underlying patterns in the, in the data that you've encrypted with it, which means that if you want to recover the, the original plain text, if you've got a, a message that someone's sent and you want to read it, you need to just look for the patterns. If the pattern's English text, um, this is a graph of all the various letter frequencies in, in the English language. So what, what you can do is you can, you can count up all the letters in you know, cipher text that you've, you've in, sort of intercepted, and you can plot them on a graph like this. And then you can sort of take a bit of a guess and say, well, the letter that occurs most commonly, that's probably the letter E, OK? Because that's the most common letter in, in the English language. And once you've done that, you can, you can guess at maybe a few others. There's a peak at sort of like around S and T and, and some of the other vowels, A and O. Um, and you can sort of start to decipher bits. And once you've got little bits, you can maybe guess at words and say, well, that, that looks like the, the word V, which is one of the most common words. And that gives you a couple more letters, and you can start decoding it. And bit by bit, you can sort of piece together the, the full text of the message. It takes a little bit of work, but you can automate it with a, with a script quite easily, and, and you can decode this on paper even. Um, so it's not really very strong. So we move on to, obviously, the, the, the substitution cipher is quite an, an old cipher. And during sort of like the 1500s, 1600s, people sought to, to improve upon this because they, they sort of realized that this, this wasn't hiding the patterns quite so well. And they came up with this cipher called the Viganeer cipher. Now, this is um, one of a group of ciphers known as polyalphabetic ciphers. It's, these are so called this because instead of just using one possible encoding for each, each letter in your, your plain text, it, it uses several different encodings. That helps it better disguise some of the, the underlying patterns in the, in the plain text. How this works for the for this cipher is in order to, to encode a message, you need to first of all pick a key. In this simple example here, I've picked the key key. Probably not a good idea to use that as your, your actual key, but it works quite nicely here for an example. And, and what we do is, using the, um, the letters here, we set A to be equal to the first letter of the key, and we get a Caesar shift for that. We do the same for E and the same for Y. And then we've got several different shifts that we use one after the other. That looks a little bit like this. So we've got a message that we want to hide Pretty, pretty secret message. You probably don't want people, people knowing that you're, you're about to blow something up. Um, you take the key, and you encode the first letter of your message using the first Caesar shift, represented by the K um, letter. The second one with E, next one with Y. Once you run out of letters in your key, you repeat it. Um, and it looks a bit like that. So we, we continue use it, reusing this key, and we get out this cipher text at the bottom. So. Anyone want to guess? Is this cipher secure? <coughs> nope. Absolutely not. Now, it, it, it did take a while longer to break it. Um, and it was credited to Charles Babbage, who's quite a, quite a well-known historic figure. Um, 
However, it wasn't until 1985 that this was actually recognised because it was he, he did it, and the British government kind of kept it a bit secret because they didn't want anyone to know that they'd broken it. Um, so until then, um, someone else, Frederick Kaziki, had been credited with the discovery. He discovered it a bit later, um, and it's him that the techniques actually named after. Unlike the simple substitution cipher, you can't actually use frequency analysis if you've got a cipher text encoded with this. Um, and if, if you were to do frequency analysis, you'd probably see something with a fairly flat graph. So all, all the letters, would be, provided the key is long enough, you'll, you'll find that the letters' frequencies are fairly similar to each other, and there's nothing that you can sort of pick out fairly easily. However, despite the fact you can't do frequency analysis because of the multiple encodings, what you can do is you can start looking for repeated sequences of letters in the ciphertext. Now, what these repeated sequences sort of tell you is possibly that's where the key has, has repeated in the, in the ciphertext. Um, and so you can count the, the distance between these repetitions, um, and you, you'll sort of notice that that's corresponding to the same word being encoded and being, being 12 letters apart. So this suggests that length of our key is a multiple of 12. Oh, well, sorry, 12 is a multiple of our, our key length. So the keyword that possibly been used to encode this text could be two, three, four, six, or even 12 characters long. Um, and then, then that, that's sort of helping us to narrow down what this, the, the, the key that was used to encode it might be. So what you can then do is, I mean, I, I'm cheating a bit because I know how long the key is. Um, I can take a guess that maybe the key's three letters long, and I split the message into three groups, taking the first letter, the fourth letter, etc., into the first group, the second letter, fifth letter, etc., into the second group, and the third letter, and so on, into the third group. You can then perform frequency analysis on those, those subgroups, and it should produce a, a graph that looks similar to the one a few slides back. Once you've done that, you can sort of take, take the graph that you're looking at, try and line up the largest letter with E, and then that sort of helps you to, to work out what the, uh, the, the keyword is at that, that position. Once you've actually done that, you'll be able to recover the key and decode the message. OK. Now, um, when I first gave this talk, I, I put together this little cipher challenge. It's a little bit more difficult than the Vigineer cipher, but very, very similar process. So if anybody fancies having a go at breaking one of these themselves, um, there's a link there. I've got it at the end of the, end of the talk, so I'll put it back up if you don't, don't manage to uh, copy it down right now. Let's move on to a different cipher. It's one probably everyone in the room, I would hope, has heard of. Enigma. Um, it was about another 100 years after the Veneer cipher that went by before the, um, the Enigma cipher came around. Um, World War II saw several attempts to mechanize cryptography. So move it from algorithms that you could perform on pen and paper to actually using machines to perform cryptographic operations. Um, obviously, the most famous attempt was the Germans' Enigma machine. Although, during the war, all the major powers, the Americans and the, and the British, were all using machines that worked in a fairly similar way um, to, to encode their, their text. I mean, the, the Americans and the, the British one was a little bit more secure than Enigma. Um, but same, same sort of underlying principles. So an Enigma machine looked a bit like this. Uh, made up of four parts, a keyboard, um, which was for sort of typing your message in. You have a typist who type it in. Um, a set of rotors at the back. Um, these acted, each of these acted as their own substitution cipher. Um, there were commonly three rotors in a machine, but some of the machines featured up to as many as eight of these rotors that could be interchanged. Um, the military machines that the German used had five different rotors, which they could use in any, any combination. So they could use like rotors one, two, three one day, and three, four, five the next day. Um, and later on, throughout the war, they expanded this to, to a, a set with a total of eight rotors, which, which provided a little bit more security. And the final component, this at the front here, was um, a plug board. Now, this switched around pairs of letters um, with, with wires. And you could use up to 13 different swaps, um, but only usually about 10 of them were used. This actually was one of the features that, that oops, was, uh, gave the machine quite a lot of its security, was the, the ability to flip these letters. Um, that's 
where quite a lot of the security came from. So this is sort of how it looks like inside. It's a, an electrical machine. Um, and so when a typist presses a key on the, on the front of an Enigma machine, an electric current completes the circuit, which goes through the plug board, through each one of the rotors, and gets sort of like mangled up. Then at the back of the machine, there's a reflector, which is literally just a load of wires that, that reconnect the, the circuit, back through each of the three rotors, back through the plug board, and finally, it illuminates a lamp on the, on the, top, of the top of the machine. Then the, the, um, the radio operator would, would send that letter, and then all the rotors would move around. And when you press it the next time, it took a different path through the machine and came up with a different letter. Um, obviously, it stepped the first rotor one at a time, and once it had gone all the way around, then that stepped over the next one. Once that had gone all the way around, it stepped the next one, and so on and so forth. That meant that each letter could be encoded in a, a vast different variety of, of different ways each time you use the same letter. Um, by changing the mappings this way, it meant that the mapping of, sort of like, uh, the plain text and cipher text was constantly changing, um, and it, it, it makes it really difficult to do any sort of like frequency analysis or anything like that on the letters. And, and sort of had the, um, the, the crypt analysis at Bletchley Park stumped for quite a while on, on how to actually analyze these, these messages. Obviously, the Enigma is quite famous, but one of the things it's famous for fa is for having been broken. Um, a team of British cryptographers um, at Bletchley Park, led by Alan Turing, who's also quite a famous guy, I've heard, um, sort of designed machines to help them break the mechanical ciphers. Um, the, the breakthroughs that the, the team made weren't particularly based on weaknesses in the cipher and, the, and the, the, the algorithm itself, but mostly on sort of operational errors made by the Germans. So examples of those errors included choosing bad keys, like AAA, as a, as a sort of initial setting for the rotors. This made it fairly trivial to, to decode. Um, and, and having predictable message structures. So, for example, the first message most of the German military units would send in the morning would be a weather report, which would contain the German word for weather, weather. And this was a, the weakness, one of the weaknesses that um, the device designed by Alan Turing sort of seized upon, and it sort of looked for um, the word weather in, in the decrypted text, and then sort of like stepped through all the possible different combinations of, of rotors and, and plugboard settings to try and find this. Um, and they had uh, full sort of like rooms full of these machines that Alan Turing and his team designed, that whenever they got a message in first thing in the morning, one of the machine operators would rush in, put the message into the machine, it would whir away for a couple of hours, it would find out the key. And once, because the Germans only changed the keys once a day, once they'd found the key for the day, they could decrypt all the messages that the Germans were sending um, for that day. And obviously that, that did actually give the, the, the British and their allies quite a big advantage in the war because they knew exactly what the Germans were up to. Um, so obviously this, this break was quite a, a big thing. So we're going to leave the, um, the historic ciphers there now. Um, we've gone sort of through all the way up to sort of the beginning of the uh, last century, with the halfway through with those machines. And we're going to take a look at some of the algorithms that are actually useful to us today for, for storing data securely. Um, modern day cryptography, um, as, as I was alluding to at the beginning, can be broken down into several different problems that we need to be able to solve to communicate securely. Um, the first one of those is, is confidentiality. We need to ensure that people other than the intended recipient can't read our messages. Um, there's a wide variety of different algorithms which people have built for, for doing this. Um, but the, the, probably the one you want to be using at, these, at the moment is AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. Um, most of these algorithms are symmetric. That is, they use the same key for both encryption and decryption. Um, there's, there's two main classes within that. Um, stream ciphers, which work on continuous streams of data, and block ciphers, which break the message up in separate blocks and encrypt each separately. I'm going to show an example of each in, in a few minutes. Um, another thing that we need to solve is, is key exchange. Obviously, if, if I want to communicate with you securely, 
we both need to have a key that we can, we can use to encrypt messages. Um, so one of, the, one of the ways that we, um, we do this is with um, asymmetric ciphers. Now, these are ciphers that use a different key for encrypting as they do for decrypting. And then we can sort of use this. You, you can give me the, the encryption key fairly safely. I can use that to encrypt a message to you, but I can't subsequently decrypt any messages that are encrypted with that key. Only you can with the, the other part of that key. Um, so that, that's quite an important, important thing that we can do. Um, another thing that we can do is verify the identity of a sender. Again, it, it works in a similar way to key exchange. You can um, sign a message using a, a private key that you keep, with, keep to secret. And you can publish a public key, and you can say, this is, this is my public key. And anyone, when they receive a message from you, can use that public key to verify that it was signed with your private key. Um, it's known as a message signature. And again, I'm going to sort of go into detail on this later on in this section. Another, another thing we need to do is authenticate a message, make sure that it hasn't been tampered with. Um, for this, we use cryptographic hash functions generally, such as SHA-256. Um, so when you can receive a message, you can compute the message hash and compare it to one that's maybe been sent along with the message and, and signed with the, the private key of the sender. If it doesn't match, you can reject the message and say, someone's messed with this, tampered with it, send it me again, or, 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 or whatever. Um, obviously, you need to combine that hash with a, a secret key of some form. Otherwise, if someone tampered with it, they could just recompute the hash. Um, and a final thing that, that quite a lot of people don't maybe realize is a part of modern cryptography is the ability to generate random numbers. So a large number of secure protocols rely on being able to generate random numbers that are actually random. Um, one example is if you're using a public key cryptography system, you might generate a random key to use the symmetric cipher and encrypt that with the, with the um, public and private keys and send the whole lot along. Now, if someone can predict the number that came out of your random number generator, they can guess what that key was, and they, they can just forget about <coughs> trying to break the algorithm. They can just decrypt the message. Um, so being able to generate secure random numbers is really important. OK, so symmetric ciphers. As I sort of previously mentioned, there's two classes of symmetric cipher. There's block and stream ciphers. Um, all of these algorithms are really only useful for dealing with message confidentiality. Um, there's no, no symmetric algorithms that you can really use for key exchange at the moment, um, and it, it sort of doesn't really solve that problem. Um, so I'm going to start by looking at stream ciphers. How a stream cipher works is it produces a constant stream of sort of pseudo-random output bytes, um, and you use a secret key that you, you, you're using to encrypt the message with as a sort of a, a seed to this generator. Um, the produced bytes from the, the, the generator then XORed with your plain text to produce the ciphertext, and then you can send that along, and the person on the other end can produce the same random pseudo-random stream of bytes and use that XORed with the plain text, uh, with the ciphertext, to recover the plain text. It's actually fairly similar to how Enigma works, in, in a way. Um, it's sort of stream ciphers sort of evolved from the Enigma machine. Um, there are several stream ciphers that we currently use today. Um, probably the most well-known is RC4, which is used in WP and, and SSL. Um, but I've, I've chosen a, a slightly different one, which is called A5-1. Now, you've probably never heard of this algorithm, but I can almost guarantee that every single one of you in this room is using it because it's used to protect voice and SMS data in mobile phones. Um, this algorithm has actually been broken. It's, it's no longer considered secure. Um, it was state-of-the-art a few decades ago, and now it's, it's quite not. Um, but it, it's an interesting one to look at as a, as a stream cipher example. Um, how it sort of works is a bit like this diagram here. So the, um, it's got a big state machine in the middle. Um, and it consists of three registers, uh, this with each, with each of a different size. And what it does is each time you want a, a new bit out of your, your random number generator, it takes the, the, the top bit out of each of these registers, 
XORs them together, and that's the, the output bit that's produced. Um, once it's done that, each of these registers is shifted to the, to the left, and depending on this byte here, so it's got these, uh, what, what they called clocking bits, and so it compares each one of the, the bits in the register and says, okay, we'll take the majority, so if, if they're all zeros, the majority is zero, and any that match that majority bit are, are clocked, and any that don't match it are left. So if you've got sort of, say, one, zero, one, the, the majority bit there is, is one, so any registers that match that, the first and the third, get clocked and, and move to the left one. In order to generate a new byte onto the back here, um, it takes the bits that are colored in blue, XORs them together, and, and produces a, a new bit on the end. Um, so take a look at that in more detail, how it actually works when it clocks. Um, this is the up uppermost register from the previous diagram. You can sort of see it's got some, some sort of numbers in there. And we clock it once, and everything shifts left, XOR all these bits, and put it back on the end. Next cycle, we do the same thing, XOR it, put it back on the end. And this generates a, a really long sequence of different bytes. And obviously, you've got three of these, so you, you get quite a large sequence of, of random data coming out of it. OK. Now, um, stream ciphers are quite useful, um, but they, they do have a few things that you need to keep in mind when you're using them. The first one is that keys must not be reused. Um, because of the way that it combines the output of the cipher using XOR, um, it will always produce the same output bytes. So if you, produce, if you encrypt two different messages with the same key, somebody can actually use those two messages to start recovering parts of your output stream, and therefore they can actually decrypt your, your messages. Um, to guard against this, a lot of stream ciphers include um, what's known as an initialization vector, or IV, which is combined in some way with the, with the secret key. And then you sort of send that IV along with your message as part of it, and then someone uses the same algorithm to combine their key with your IV, and then that makes sure that you're always using a, a different key for each message. Um, WPEP is actually vulnerable because of this. Um, although they use an IV in the, in the initialization of the, the RC4 algorithm, the IV that they picked was too small, which means that over some time, if you're sending lots of Wi-Fi packets back and forth, you'll eventually repeat not just the secret key, but the, the IVs will repeat. That means that once, once someone detects two messages using the same IV, they can use those messages to decode the output stream, and at that point, they can, they can sort of recover the, the key for the network and connect to your Wi-Fi network and sniff your traffic and things, which is sort of why we've sort of phased out WP in, in Wi-Fi these days. Um, it's kind of easy for an attacker to modify a message. So let's say you're downloading a, a HTML page for WebCypher and you're encoding it with um, a stream cipher. Anyone who can sort of guess that maybe there's a JavaScript file in the header of that can actually compute a, um, an XOR with what they think might be in the message and what they really want in the message, and XOR that into the ciphertext, and that will actually replace it in the ciphertext, and it will decode to what they want it to rather than what was sent. Um, this means that when you're actually using the stream cipher, you need to make sure you've got some sort of message authentication to prevent this tampering, such as a, a, sorry, a message hash. Um, it's also, it's not so much a security concern, more of a practical one. Most stream ciphers require that you run them all the way through to decrypt a message, and you can't sort of arbitrarily seek into a stream cipher. Some of them have been designed to allow this, but most do not. Um, this means if you're, say, you've encrypted a huge 50 gig database backup using a stream cipher, and you need to recover one table worth of data from that backup, and you know that it's 20 gig away in, you're still going to have to decrypt the first 20 gig to get to that table data. Um, you can't just sort of seek into it and, and decrypt just the bit you need. Um, so that, that's sort of something to be aware of. Uh, next thing we look at uh, not, uh, is the block cipher. The key difference between a, a block and a stream cipher is that um, whereas a stream cipher produces a, a 
basically a pseudo random stream where you, you can use to encrypt. A block cipher actually works on a block of your plain text directly and applies various different mathematical transformations to it. Now, the, the size of block works differently depending on the algorithm, um, but it's usually much shorter than any message you might want to send. Um, AES, for example, uses 128 bit blocks. Um, older ciphers tend to use 64 bits. Um, so that's, that's obviously a lot shorter than any, any message you're going to want to send. So um, you need to break up your message into blocks and encrypt each one separately. And that's where the name comes from, a block cipher. So obviously, the, um, probably the most famous um, one of them you will have heard of is AS. And that's kind of like the, probably the one you'll be using for a lot of your day-to-day -day encryption needs. Um, AS was a, the result of a cryptography competition to find a, a replacement for an older, an older encryption standard, the data encryption standard. Um, and it was eventually won by a slight variant of the Ryan gel algorithm. Now, you might know, if you've been using the mcrypt extension, that there, are, there is a different flavor of AS that's just called Ryan gel. And if you use the wrong constants with mcrypt, you use that one instead, which is not quite what you want. Um, bit of a gotcha there. Fortunately, it's been deprecated, but if anyone's still using it, it's something to look out for. Um, so how AES works is it's got, um, so you start off with a your, your message and you apply the AES algorithm to it um, repeatedly for a few cycles. Um, depending on the key length is depending on how many, how many actual cycles you, you run through of AES. Um, each round of uh, an AES consists of four distinct phases, um, which is substitute bytes, um, shift rows, mix columns, and then it adds a portion of the, of the secret key to the data, and then it repeats the loop again. Um, so each one of those rounds is applied every time you, you sort of loop through it. Look in a bit more detail, the substitute bytes, um, it works on a, a block size of 128 bits, and it's effectively got a, a substitution cipher with a fixed key. Um, now, the, the key has actually been chosen to try and uh, avoid a number of different algorithmic um, and cryptographic techniques to sort of provide defense against various, various techniques that um, were used against the predecessor DES. Um, so the, the, the bits in the substitution table have been chosen specifically. Um, and, and what happens basically is it just takes the, the current byte in the state, looks up um, that byte in the substitution table, and replaces that byte in your, your current block with the byte from the substitution table. Um, the next thing that happens is each, each row in your, in your sort of block is, is shifted using a bit shift operation. Um, and then you, you sort of like rotate the first byte around to the, around to the end. So it sort of does that. Looks like that diagram. Uh, the third step is, is a bit of a, a complicated um, mathematical operation, uh, but it effectively does a, a multiplication over each column, um, and it, 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 do, it does that to sort of like mix up the, the data in a different way. Um, for the final round of the cipher, this step is actually skipped over, so it, it doesn't um, it doesn't occur in the last round, but it's every round other than that. Um, and then finally, it takes a byte from your key and XORs it with a byte in the block and then produces the final output. Um, once you've gone through all of those steps um, a, a number of times, I think it's 14 rounds for 128 bit key, then you output a block of ciphertext. Um, it's quite an efficient algorithm. It's implemented in, in hardware in quite a lot of processes these days, so it's, it's very fast to compute. Um, and uh, that's, that's sort of how it works. Now, Obviously, with a block cipher, you're going to want to encrypt more than 128 bits at a time. And so when we use a block cipher on a message that's longer than that, we've got to split it up into blocks. However, there are quite a lot of different ways in which you can utilize a block cipher. Um, and these are known as modes of operations. So one mode um, is known as the electronic cookbook. It's probably the one that you'd, you'd sort of think up first is you literally encrypt a block of text, and then the next one, and the next one, and just append them like that. So you've got a plain text, you've got a key, you do your block cipher encryption, and you get an output block. 
You do it the next block, next block, and you just start pen them. Believe it or not, this is a really bad mode, which you shouldn't use. Um, although a block cipher produces a really random output, and it's, it's really difficult to, to sort of reverse that, um, any block, which any piece of plain text that's the same, the same 128 bits, will come out as a cipher text that's exactly the same. This actually gives you the same problems as with a substitution cipher, where someone can actually look at statistical patterns in your data. Obviously, it's a bit more difficult, but take a look at this penguin, Tux, Linux mascot. Um, and that's Tux encrypted using AS in ECB mode. You can quite clearly see that, that Tux is, is still there. Now, if this, this was an image that maybe you, you wanted not for people not to be able to see, um, have it, having it like that probably wouldn't be your, your desired um, result. So you should never really use ECB mode unless you just want to make cool pop art images like this. That's, that's, that's a legitimate use, I guess. So a bit of an improvement. Um, the first sort of attempt to fix that sort of problem was called cipher block chaining. How that sort of works is you take an initialization vector, similar to, um, to a stream cipher, and you feed that in for your first block. And you XOR it with your plain text, pass it through a block cipher encryption, and then you get your cipher text. For your next block, you pass that cipher text back in, XOR with the plain text, and, and pass it through. And you do that all the way along. This adds a sort of like a, a randomizer to your, your plain text. So even if you've got two blocks that are the same, because this and this aren't going to be the same, they're going to come out differently. Um, it's obviously a bit similar to a stream cipher in the fact that you need an initialization vector and you should not reuse those. Um, but that sort of half solves the, 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 um, the problems with ECB. Um, another, another mode that's being used is called CTR mode or counter mode. This is quite a cool mode in the fact that it turns a block cipher into a stream cipher with a few advantages. So it completely differs from the previous two modes that we've looked at as we no longer directly encrypt our plain text. What we do is we start off with a, a nonce uh, or an initialization vector again, and we have a counter, which we start 0, 0, 0, 0. And we encrypt that instead and XOR it with our, our plain text which produces ciphertext. Then for the next block, you increment the counter, encrypt that, and XOR it. You keep on going until you've got enough um, bytes to encrypt your whole message. Now, due to the random nature of the, uh, the output of a block cipher, um, it effectively turns this into a, a stream cipher. Now, obviously, with CTR mode, you need to set the same precautions as with a stream cipher, such as not reusing the um, IV and things, and ensuring that you've got a um, uh, a, a, a sort of a message authentication to, to make sure that it's not been tampered with. Um, something else that this gives you that stream cipher doesn't is you can actually seek into your encrypted text. Because if you want to get block 557, all you do is take your nonce, increment the counter to 557, pass it to the block cipher, and you can decrypt into your, into your encrypted data. You can decrypt it and without having to decrypt everything up to that point. Um, another mode which, which sort of helps alleviate the issue that we had with, um, with CTR mode in the fact that it's a stream cipher without authentication is um, Galoris counter mode. What this does is it combines the counter mode with um, an authentication tag which helps verify that the message hasn't been tampered with. Um, and how that works is, first of all, you've got here, you've basically got the, count, you've got the counter mode going on up here as well. But you also have a separate part of your key, which is auth data here, which goes to a multiplication function. And then you start XORing it with each of your ciphertext bytes. And you sort of chain on lots of different multiplications of your ciphertext. And then finally, um, add on the length of your, your, um, your ciphertext and data. And that produces you an auth authentication tag, which when the person who you are sending the message to receives it, they can verify that authentication tag before decrypting the message and make sure it hasn't been tampered with. Um, that's, that's sort of how that works. 
So that's, that's sort of covered off a lot of the, the symmetric ciphers. Um, all of those ciphers that we've looked at so far, including even the historic ones, use a single key for both encrypting and decrypting. That leads to a really hard to solve problem, which is key distribution. Um, imagine for a moment that you're uh, an undercover agent. Alice is undercover um, and in deep in MMA operations and needs to get a secret message back to Bob at HQ to, to send mission reports and, and tell Bob what the, the evil overlord is, is up to. Um, and they obviously need to do so without the, the, uh, the agents of the enemy, Mallory and Eve, eavesdropping and modifying the messages. Um, this is where the asymmetric ciphers actually comes in. Because they use different keys for encryption and decryption, um, we don't need to sort of pre-share keys, so I can just keep on encrypting messages to you without having to worry about um, keeping my key secure and things like that. And even if I send a message out and it's intercepted and the, the enemy capture it, they won't be able to s search my room and, and find the key that I use to encrypt it because it's a, a public key that, that can't decrypt it again. Um, so uh, looking at public key cryptography, um, a, a quite a good good way of thinking about this is if you think about a padlock. So there's a padlock, okay? Now imagine that I, I want to send a message to someone at the back of the room, or they want to send one to me. What I could do is I could give them a metal box, a nice, nice sturdy metal box, and they could write a bit of mes a message on a piece of paper, and I could give them my padlock, okay? And they could, they could attach this padlock to the box, locking it, and they could pass, them a, pass the box back from the back of the room past all you people, who, who we don't really trust, um, back to me. And none of you, unless you've got some bolt cutters, brute force, are going to be able to undo that padlock. But as soon as it gets back to me, I've got the, I've got the private key I'm keeping over here. And I can unlock it, and I can read the message. That's kind of the same, same idea that, that public key cryptography uses. Well, the first and sort of oldest public key system is, is RSA. Um, despite the huge amount of processing power improvements and things like that we've made since its invention, um, it's, it's still quite a secure algorithm. Um, it relies on a, a sort of mathematical problem, which is quite easy to compute in one direction, but is really difficult to sort of reverse. And how it sort of, so if you've just set this mathematical problem, it's really difficult to reverse. But if you happen to know a secret that was used when constructing the problem, it's really easy for you to reverse again. Um, we have actually come up with better public key algorithms since, but only by the virtue of the fact that they're, they're actually more efficient to implement in code, and they use less CPU cycles to run. Um, they're not actually much greater in the level of security they provide. Um, mm. It's just that you can use shorter keys with them. So the pro mathematical problem that RSA is based on is um, exponential in modular arithmetic. So the idea is that you can find three rather large numbers, um, e, here, d, and a prime number, n, and such that when you take um, e to uh, take any number and raise it to the power of e, and then raise it to the power of d, it equals it itself modulus your prime number, n. Okay, so it's sort of it's cyclic. Um, now, if you've got a message that's been encoded like this, and you only have e, it is really, really difficult to figure out what d is, mathematically. However, if you already know d, you, you can actually reverse it. So you can make this number n and e publicly available, and you can, you can pose this mathematical problem to the world, safe in the knowledge that it's really, really hard for them to solve it. Um, and so in order to actually use this for a crypto system, what you can do is you've got my, my uh, public key, which is E and N, and you can take the message that you want to send to me, you can raise it to the power of E, take its modulus by my prime number, N, and that becomes a ciphertext. You can send that to me, safe in the knowledge that, that <coughs> only the person with D can um, do this multiplication here and reverse the process and turn it back into the plain text, M. Um, obviously, a slight issue with this scheme is that the message M must be smaller than this, this modulus you use. Um, so 
usually what you'll do with RSA and, and similar public key algorithms is that you'll generate a random string that you use for a, a symmetric cipher like AES, and then you'll use RSA or um, another public key algorithm to encrypt just the key part of the, the symmetric cipher. And then you'll send the cipher text from the symmetric cipher, the encrypted key, to your intended recipient. They can then use their private key to recover the, the random key, and then they can decrypt the <coughs> message. So it's a two-stage process. Um, and, and that sort of solves the key distribution problem. Another thing we need to solve is identification of um, identity verification. So although Alice and Bob can send messages to each other securely without Eve being able to eavesdrop and, and recover those messages. Um, how can they protect from the mischievous Mallory who likes to, to tamper with messages and, and change them? Turns out you can actually use a similar thing with RSA. Um, if I take a message, say a um, hash of the ciphertext that I'm, I'm sending to you, and I raise it to the power of my private key, D, um, I, I can send that as a signature. When Bob, back in the office, receives that message, he can raise it to the power of my public key, and if it has been signed using my private key, it will return back to the value of the hash. He can then hash the message, check it matches, and then he knows that it was sent by Alice. Obviously, if it doesn't match, then something's gone wrong, and, and he, he knows that the message has been tampered with or, or didn't come from Alice in the first place. Again, in practice, that, that message must be short. So the signature is usually a cryptographic hash of the message, like SHA-256 or, or similar. Um, so I've covered a, a selection of, of all the algorithms that are in use today that, that solve quite a lot of the, the problems in modern cryptography. Um, so th this last five minutes or so, um, we're going to have a look at how you'd actually go about implementing cryptography in, in applications, if, if that's what you need to do. So the first bit of information, bit of advice, is don't. Um, I hope that you've sort of got an idea from this talk just how, how many things you have to sort of keep an eye on and how difficult it is to actually do these things securely. So if you've got a need to encrypt data, don't try and do it yourself as much as possible. Um, it's very easy to introduce vulnerabilities into applications through um, things like side channels, um, someone measuring how, e even if you take AES, which is a secure algorithm, and implement it, if you um, don't take care of things like how long it takes to encrypt the data, someone might be able to retrieve information about your key or your plain text just by measuring how long it actually takes to encrypt messages and things like that. Um, so the best bit of advice is use an existing implementation. Okay? Everything I've gone over today is battle-tested and, and hardened, and it's been <laughs> poured over by cryptographers for at least a decade. And there are well-known, well-tested, well-used implementations out there. Use one of those. Okay? Um, most Linux distros, for example, allow you to encrypt hard drive partitions. That's a good first starting point. Um, all the major web servers have support for TLS. Use SSL for your connections between, between servers. Don't try and manually implement in your application some sort of encrypting, send it over HTTP, <laughs> decrypt it on the other side. Just use HTTPS. It's well tested, it's, it's going to work. Okay. Um, another option, um, if you've got like two, two remote data centers, you could use a VPN between the two or maybe an SSH tunnel. Again, all of these protocols and algorithms have been well tested. There's lots of people going over the source code all the time. They're patching the security vulnerabilities and things like that. You're benefiting from the knowledge of people who, who do this all the time. Okay? Um, if one of those situations doesn't fit your use case, if you do actually need to implement some cryptography, bring in an expert. Okay? Um, bring in someone to audit your code and make sure you've not made any mistakes. Um, it's, it's not a, cryptography isn't a skill that most developers are like really tip top on. So although you can probably implement it, bring someone in, an expert, an outside consultancy, and get them to just make sure you've done it right. Um, it might seem expensive to bring someone in to do that, but it's nothing compared to the costs if you become sort of like, if you get hacked and you become the next like Ashley Madison or, or Sony that sort of, sort of get 
all that data spewed all over the internet. Um, especially with the, the GDPR coming in now, um, that's, that can be quite costly if, if you make a mistake with this stuff. So you bring an expert, it'll save you money and worry in the long run. Um, obviously, this is a PHP conference, so what, do you need to, what, do you, what should you do if you actually need to encrypt and decrypt stuff in PHP? Um, there's a lot of libraries out there. I've I reviewed a lot of them. Um, there's quite a few that default to using pop art penguin mode um, and insecure other options. And if you were to just download it with Composer and be like, yep, yeah, that's a library, I'll use that, you'll, you'll end up with a few problems, like people being able to view your images or sort of like pop art versions of them. Um, so, top of my list of recommendations is a library that uh, Scott Akazuki has written, which is Halite. Halite's a, a wrapper around Libsodium, um, which is a, a library that's been written by cryptographers to limit the amount of choices that developers are given. You've got one implementation of things, and that's a secure implementation. And that's the sort of the design goal of Libsodium. Um, and, and Halite just provides a, a high level interface for that, which is really straightforward. It looks a little bit like this. That would be how you would encrypt something using Halite, the wrapper um, around Libsodium. It's that easy, and that will be secure. Okay? Um, so if, if you need to do something, that's your best option. Um, Libsodium is in PHP 7.2. Um, you can install the extension from Peckle um, for, for sort of versions before 7.2. If you're in an environment where you can't install it, Scott's also written a polyfill in PHP, which you can actually include, and it's got all the, the same algorithms written in PHP. Um, so you, you've got a fairly good range of options there if you, if you want to use that. If for some reason you, you can't use Libsodium, <coughs> for whatever reason, maybe you need uh, compatibility with a legacy system or something like that, um, diffuse PHP encryption is, um, Another good library that's implemented in PHP. Um, it, look, it uses a lot more of the, the, sort of the older style algorithms, AES and, um, and, and RSA for its, its cryptography. Um, and it, it tries to implement those in a secure way and it'll fall back to, to like OpenSSL if you've got that installed and things like that. So it'll still be quite performant. Um, so that, that's, that's another option. It's got a fairly similar API to Halite, so it's pretty much diffuse encrypt and diffuse decrypt. So it's easy to get right. Um, so that, that's pretty much the end of, close to the end of the talk. So I've got a few links now for anybody who's interested in finding out more. Um, there's, there's a wealth of, of really interesting stuff on cryptography. Um, one, one of the best ones, if you're interested in the historic side of the talk, is Simon Singh's The Code Book. He's got a few of the ones I went over and a few other ones. And there's also some really interesting case studies on what happened when cryptography went wrong. Um, it's a really good resource. He's also got a website where you can actually try out some of these um, ciphers, and you can encode and decode messages and do things like that. Um, another good resource, if you're interested in modern cryptography, is Bruce Schneier's site. Um, Bruce Schneier's a, a well-known cryptographer, uh, worked for a lot of leading corp companies on security and things like that. Um, he also created Blowfish and, and the bcrypt hash function, which you're hopefully using for your passwords. Um, so if you do feel like starting messing around creating your own algorithms, he's got a, a self-study course on his website, which starts off showing you how to like, with, with increasing difficulty of algorithms you can have a go at breaking yourself. Um, one of the things, in, in order to become a good cryptographer, you need to be able to prove that you can break other algorithms. That way, any, anything that you've done, you, you know that if, if you're really good at breaking algorithms and you can't break your algorithm, it's pretty good. But if you're just like someone who's just turned up and be like, yeah, I've just invented this thing, how, how, how can we trust that that's any good? Well, if you've got a proven track record of being able to break cryptography, and you say it's good, we can probably trust that. So if, if you're interested in sort of, sort of getting into that side, his, his course is pretty good. Um, the final link there is a library called PHP Crypt. Do not use this in production. Um, absolutely not. Um, but it includes a pure PHP implementation of quite a lot of the interesting ciphers. So if you actually want to have a look at the code implementation of some of these, including the historic ones, I think it's got Enigma in there and a, and a few others. Um, it's quite a good one to just have a look at the source code and, and see how they, they tick underneath. Um, but yeah, obviously none of those are suitable for anything 
other than sort of like your own personal interest in, in cryptography. Right, I um, hope everyone sort of learned something from this talk and, and found it interesting. My, my Twitter handles give up already. Um, I've also got GitLab, GitHub with a few, few projects and things like that on. Um, interesting post on my blog, uh, if anyone's interested. I, I broke an algorithm that someone implemented themselves. One of my blog posts is actually showing why, why you shouldn't actually do these kind of things. Um, and finally, there is a joined in link. If, if you want to rate this talk, let me know if it's any good. <laughs>